So again, thank you very much for being here. I've just found out that I've got less time than I thought I had so well. Uh, let's hope that I can tell you at least part of what I wanted to tell you today. Now, the title of my talk is Making Yourself Understood in International English. Uh, well, we're going to explain exactly, or I'm going to explain exactly to you what I mean by international English because this is quite a generic term. Uh, as this is a polyglot gathering that I would, like you, I would like to kind of justify my presence here, okay? So I do speak languages, although uh, my mother tongue is Polish, as you can, well, imagine. I also speak Spanish, that's where I live, in Spain. I speak English because I teach English. I also speak French, German, and Catalan. But I've been in touch with other languages as well throughout my life. However, now I'm focusing on my PhD, so well, I cannot learn languages uh, as much as I would like to. That's Latin. <laughs> yeah, well, I can't speak Latin, although there is a very uh, funny event in Madrid, which is like a spoken Latin course every year, but it's in August and I'm always on holiday, but I'd like to do it once. Okay. So uh, you can see my academic background here. So as you can see, well, now I'm doing my PhD in English linguistics and this, what I'm going to speak about today is related to my PhD, although it's not exactly my PhD research, but I've got background as well in, uh, well, Romance languages and, well, that's why I speak mostly Romance languages and Germanic languages. Okay, and now I live in Spain and I'm an English teacher, a lecturer at a private university. So. Uh, in this talk, we're going to take a look at what international English is, that's the first part, what English as a lingua franca is, and then we're going to take a very brief look at what English as a lingua franca research says about grammar and pragmatics, and then the most important part, because I, well, I work in pronunciation, is pronunciation, okay? So how English uh, is pronounced internationally and what research, again, says about it, okay? It's going to be quite basic, Okay, but I didn't want to make it too difficult. And there is quite a lot of information, so I hope, it, I hope it's not overwhelming. Now, the aim of this talk is just to give you some food for talk, to look at English from a slightly different perspective, although, well, we probably already do see English as an international language, and it's pretty, uh, well, well, the very name is quite self-explanatory. Okay? And there will be some practical tasks, although I don't know if we're going to have time for these. Okay? because at the end of the day, well, this is a talk and not a practical workshop. Um, okay, I'm going to skip this, and we're going to take a look at some data related to English. So, well, these data, these statistics are taken from many different sources in many different, well, at many different points in time, but I would like you to just think and give me an estimate. How many people in the world use English? What number could you give me? Two billion. Well, that's quite close. It's probably two billion. In this report from the British Council, 2013, it's 1.75 billion. Now, how many or what percentage of all those speakers of English, that's native speakers, what would you say? 80. So if we take that number into account, that's 25%, although probably it's even fewer. Hmm? And in 2004, what percentage of European secondary pupils studied English? What do you think? So it was 90, but probably now it's 95 or 99, okay? Because everybody basically studies English. Now, I like this statistic because it is from year 1991, okay? What percentage of interaction in English happen, happens amongst non-native speakers? Mm -hmm. You're quite close, 70%. So that was 80%, but that was before the advent of the internet. Okay, so you can imagine that nowadays, it's really probably in the region of 95%, okay, or even more. And English is official in a way in how many countries? 50. In 88 countries, and we've got just over 200 countries in the world. So English is a big thing, okay? And obviously you can imagine that, well, not all those people who speak English are native speakers. Hmm? Define official. Well, it's hard to define official because if you think of it, uh, English is not even the official language of the United States of America. Yeah. 
So English is used in official situations uh, defined by the institutions of 88 countries. Okay, that would be a working definition, but that's a very good question. Okay. Um, now, also, it is the common tongue of the Seven Kingdoms, and well, it's definitely a very useful language. Okay, so I really like this uh, advertisement. Okay. Just imagine how far you can go with a little bit of English, and we all know who she is. Now, conceptualizing international English and ELF, English as a lingua franca. So we know that English is used worldwide, and it's used for many different purposes, okay? It's used in entertainment, it's used in air traffic control, it's used, well, it's taught as a foreign language. It's the language of the EU, EN, of the Asian European Union as well. It's the language of diplomacy, and it's the language of science, okay? Now, why is it English, you might ask? I know it's an obvious question, but we're just going to very briefly go over this. Obviously for, historic, oh, sorry, for historical reasons, okay? And then all the other reasons are actually related to the historical development and the spread of English, okay? So we've got internal political reasons. So English is the means of communication defined by certain countries and institutions for certain purposes, okay? In certain countries, it's only the language that's used uh, as the language of the academia, okay? Uh, also, in the economy, that's basically business English. We've got practical reason. Well, I've mixed these two. Uh, it's also the language of the academia, as we said before, which is intellectual reasons and entertainment. So this is basically uh, a revision of what was on the previous slide. Now, when we think about the spread of English around the world, okay, we can conceptualize it and we can look at it from many different perspectives. Okay? In English as a lingua franca research, I'm going to define English as a lingua franca in a moment. Uh, the usual conceptualization is the first one, okay? So around the world, we've got different types of Englishes. We've got the, well, we're only going to have a look at the first diagram, okay? The Catruvian model of concentric circles. We've got English that is spoken in the inner circle. That would be the English that's spoken in the traditionally native countries, okay? In the US, in the UK, in Ireland, in uh, Canada, in Australia, and in New Zealand. Then we've got the outer circle Englishes, which are the post-colonial Englishes. And then we've got the expanding circle, which is basically the rest of the world that speaks English nowadays. Okay? Now, historically speaking, it's not always that outer circle uh, comes after inner circle, because if you think of Indian English, Indian English is actually older than Australian English, for example, okay? because the colonization of India happened before. Uh, and there are many others, okay? but we're not going to go over them because we don't have time for that. Now, English as a lingua franca, that term that I used at the very beginning, tries to look at English as something that is used by everybody in the world, okay? So it's not only used by native speakers, and this is very often how we think of English, okay? Even if we know that at this event, for example, everybody speaks English from different countries, but then we learn and study you know, a national variety of English, either British or American. And we tend to think of English as something that belongs to those people, and we kind of need to imitate them in a way, okay? While the reality in numbers is slightly different, okay? There are native speakers, but there are many more non-native speakers, okay? Foreign language speakers or um, second language speakers, which are not the same. Well, but that depends, again, on the way you define it. Uh, so nobody is the owner of English nowadays, okay? And then... Uh, the norm of English, obviously that's British or American English, but that's something that could be questioned at a certain point in time, okay? Maybe not now and not here today because that's quite controversial. Uh, I'd like to show you this, um, this quote from the very same report that we already had some statistics from, which says that, well, the English language is perhaps the United Kingdom's greatest and yet least uh, recognized international asset. It's a cornerstone of our identity, and it keeps us in the mind of hundreds of millions of people around the world, even when they're not talking to us, okay? And I'd like you to look at this, because I personally, and there is going to be some political agitation here, completely disagree with it, okay? So I think that English is an international language. It's a lingua franca. And I think that if I, as a Polish person, go to Finland and meet a guy from Russia and we speak English, we do not keep the Brits in mind, okay? But still there is this idea that English kind of belongs to them and there is a huge market of English teaching that comes from the United Kingdom, okay? So you can see this kind of, you know, imperialistic 
tone in this message, okay? Uh, now, the lingua franca, the, the term itself, you know, comes from the Mediterranean lingua franca that used to be used in the Middle Ages to communicate for trade reasons, okay? It was a mixture of many different, mainly Romance languages, okay? English is similar in many regards, but it's also different because English is just one language. It's not, well, English as a lingua franca is not a mixture of different languages, but it does, you know, every single participant does bring in elements of their own culture, identity, and of their own language into that communication, okay? So English as a lingua franca is something that we all kind of create when we communicate, that we all negotiate meaning and understanding in, okay? Um, there are two definitions of English as a lingua franca that I'd like you to take a look at. The first one is from the European Commission, and you can see that English as a lingua franca is a language that allows intercomprehension among people speaking different mother tongues. It's a neutral language, okay, of which nobody can claim ownership, but also the mother tongue of some of the participants, okay, because we don't want to exclude uh, native speakers. However, you have to know that at the very beginning of English as lingua franca research, well, native speakers were not even taken into account, okay? So, well, there was some criticism. And what, what I like about the second definition is that it is, at the end of the day, the communicative medium of choice, okay? So we all choose to speak English, okay? Or not, yeah, and there is an English free zone. Yeah? Si? Si. No, del inglés como lengua franca. Ha. Entonces, la teoría... Oh, I don't know if I should answer in Spanish or in English. Uh, well, theoretically, it should be neutral. Okay, in what sense is it neutral? Okay, imagine that you've got an exchange uh, between native speakers. Okay, English is a language, especially in the UK, for example, that you judge people by. Okay, but imagine that if we speak English here, okay, nobody is judged by the way they speak English. So in that sense, it is neutral. Okay? It doesn't belong to, en to anybody. As long as you can communicate in it, that's fine. Okay? You're not going to be, well, you're, well, there are going to be no value judgments uh, about your person based on how you speak English, or there shouldn't be. Okay? This is the theoretical assumption. You may disagree, okay? but we may <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, but in that sense it's neutral, okay, but I think that, well, that's a, uh, that's a very interesting issue and language and judgment always go together so well. Can't be totally neutral, okay, but that would be the ideal situation, okay? Uh, now, you may ask, so why do we think about, you know, English as a lingua franca and not just English as a foreign language, okay? Because English is a different language as a foreign language. If you, for example, study French as a foreign language, then obviously you study it mostly to communicate with other French speakers, okay? Native speakers, most of the time, okay? Unless you come to an event like this and then, well, you, you've got somebody from Germany and you want to speak French with them. But this is a very special situation. You won't normally do it when you learn a foreign language that's not a lingua franca, okay? You learn it. If I study German, that's because I want to work in Germany, okay? Not because I want to go to Canada and speak German to those people. But I study English, for example, to speak to you, to speak to the Brits, to speak to Americans, to speak to Indians, to the Japanese, and to the Russians, because, well, I'm Polish, but my generation doesn't speak Russian anymore, okay? So that would be the difference, okay? Uh, the changing context of usage uh, of English as a foreign language, okay? It is by no means a new kind of, you know, idea that wants to reject English as a foreign language, okay? English is still a foreign language, okay? It just draws on it and adds to it, okay? And it's also about prioritizing what's, what's important and what isn't, because there are certain things in English that are not so needed for international communication. Uh, this we've already seen. It's also realistic and fair to the speakers because we're following a native kind of, you know, standard is not realistic because you will never get there, okay? And that is a research-based statement, okay? And it's more of a mindset and a skill set than, than a new standard of any kind, okay? So when we talk about English as lingua franca, it doesn't mean that there is a new norm and you should follow this, okay? It's just about conceptualizing how you think of English, okay? And a skill set, in this case, this, is, this comes from a very new publication, very recent publication, uh, on, uh, on the teaching of English as a lingua franca, 
uh, the skill set would be what you need to communicate effectively and to understand people from other countries. And this makes sense because even the other day I was reading, um, I was on Facebook, and I think that there are some researchers in the United States or in Canada, I can't remember where, who are proposing like activities for native speakers of English for them to understand international English because they have problems, okay? Understanding non-native varieties, okay? But there's a very broad issue. Uh, now, this only summarizes what I said before, so it's just basically a change of perspective. And I would like to stress again that English works in a different way to other foreign languages, okay? If you learn Japanese, that's because you want to speak to Japanese people, okay? If you learn English, that's because you want to speak to everybody, okay? Uh, there is a lot of criticism, some of this criticism I've already uh, received here, but we're not going to get there, okay? Then you can criticize me later, okay? And it doesn't actually, well, the fact that I'm speaking about this doesn't actually mean that I have nothing against this paradigm, okay? I'm just working within it, I'm trying to improve it. Uh, now, uh, just one word on the research in English as a Franca, you can find a lot of different corpora online, well, the first to that you've got here, Voice, which, is, uh, which was compiled in Vienna, 100 million words of exchanges in English between uh, non-native speakers. Then there is another one in academic settings. Um, and the first one is free, so you can actually see how people speak in English for free. Okay? The other one you need to ask, you need to request access to. And there are loads of publications, as you can see. Uh, this, the first publication, is the f kind of founding publication that we're going to uh, come back to later, okay? So now, about criticism, because I'm sure that now you want to criticize me, and I'm going to give you a minute, okay, just to think of the criticism that you might have, okay? Then, well, you can also ask me questions so that I can answer them in this minute, okay? There is a timer on the screen, so just think. You can speak to your partner, or you can just do some inner brainstorming, okay? You don't have to follow these questions, just, well, what do you think about this all? That's the word. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I agree with you. It's very liberating. You know, I'm, I'm, I tend to be quite good at accents, but I really get very self-conscious when people comment on my accent, even if those comments are quite positive, because it makes you, you know, you, you want to live up to the standard that the person expects from you, yeah. Okay, the, yeah, you want to say something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, you, you, you've already got the skill set. You've already got the skill set, you know. Mm. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need to acknowledge reality, okay? Whether it should be like that or not, that's a completely different question. Mm. 
Okay. As I would like to continue then, well, we're going to have time to discuss this issue. As you can see, well, there is quite a lot of controversy because, yeah, language and judgment and, well, laughing at people, it still happens, but it shouldn't at the end of the day, okay? Uh, so, just very, very briefly, we're going to take a look at uh, the grammar of English as an international language or English as a lingua franca. And now, after this, you're going to tell me, but these are just the basic mistakes that everybody does when they, you know, set out on the journey of English learning. And that's true, but you should know that all of these examples come from very proficient users, okay? C1, C2 users, okay? So we're not talking, we're talking about maybe some very basic mistakes, okay, from the native perspective, but they do not cause intelligibility problems, okay? And they happen to everybody, even very proficient speakers, okay? And well, many of them are very, very obvious, okay? Dropping the third per person, Yes, this happens to C1 speakers as well, and it has been attested by many studies, okay? Another thing that happens to my Spanish students is that they may misplace the S and say it's help instead of it helps. Now, is that a problem? Well, grammatically speaking, yes, but is that a problem from the point of view of communication? Well, very seldom, okay? Another thing was, is lack of agreement, so the famous people is, which is registered at very advanced levels in English as a lingua franca. Well, confusing who and which, and I thought that was going to be in favor of which, but actually, nope, okay? There are loads of people who say who for things. Hmm? So again, we've got people which, deviations in these, in these of articles, that happens a lot, okay? It's probably m one of the most common problems in English as an international language, still not a problem for intelligibility. Whether I say in Polish language or in the Polish language, which is correct, well, you're going to understand me. Anyway, okay, or things like this. This is actually a correct English sentence, but well, uh, I like the dogs more than the cats, but only when referring to specific dogs. And well, many people use it with a general meaning. Or for example, question tags. Now, many English teachers like to teach us question tags, but who uses question tags properly? I mean, I'm not saying nobody does when they're not a native speaker, but many people simplify this aspect of English, okay? And even my colleagues who are native speakers of English who work with me, they end up saying, it's true, no, uh, after years and years spent in Spain, okay? What no o verdad is the question tag, okay? And we've got the uh, general, well, generic question tag, isn't it, which is even used in native varieties, okay? Hence the famous in it, okay? Uh, well, two infinitives that are, changed to, uh, that are changed to that clauses, that happens a lot because other Germanic languages and Romance languages use these clauses. So I want that instead of I want to, I want you to do something, okay? This happens a lot at very high levels, okay? Uh, countable and uncountable nouns, that's a very huge part of English grammar. Again, people make mistakes. The other day I wasn't here, but I was actually watching the opening ceremony and there were mistakes of this sort in that very ceremony, but everything was clear and perfect. So we shouldn't probably worry about informations so much. And I've got native speaking friends from Singapore, for example, who say stuffs and furnitures on a regular basis, okay? So this is already a nativized feature of certain English varieties of the outer circle, okay? And prepositions, what happens in, with prepositions is that people tend to use in, uh, Mm, quite a lot, and at, which is a very nice English preposition, is not used so much, okay? And this is something that's been demonstrated statistically, okay, compared to uh, native English. Well, there is also some redundancy. Things like discuss about are very common, although discuss is a transitive verb in English. And also up and down are almost never used as prepositions in international English, okay? They can be adverbs, they can be particles, but they can also be prepositions, okay? So, elf speakers kind of do not acknowledge their existence as prepositions, okay? I'm not saying everybody, I'm just saying that that's the general tendency. Well, we've got two exchanges, English as a, Frank, a lingua franca exchanges. If you could just tell me for a moment what kind of deviations from the native norm you can see here. Yeah? It's mm -hmm. it's a funny thing. Yeah, there is, I think, but I don't have it. Somebody had the, well, yeah. Yeah, 
It was right there. Okay, but I can just repeat that. It was, it's a funny thing. So I've actually marked them for you. Well, so there are problems with articles here. Still, it's kind of, you know, easy to understand because it's not a problem, okay? There are problems with prepositions. There are problems with verbs. But overall, it's, uh, an, you know, an exchange at a, a, at a quite advanced level. And it's fairly easy to understand, okay? It's a transcription of spoken interaction. So it might be, uh, it might be difficult at a first glance. But, well, that's how people speak, and they get their messages across, which is what it's all about. Now, pragmatics, okay? So, um, it has been found that in, in international English, there is very little misunderstanding, in spite of the fact that there are a lot of mistakes, okay? But there is very little misunderstanding. People negotiate meaning constantly, and they just, well, they just communicate. They get the messages across, okay? Uh, English as a lingua franca is more explicit and redundant. Okay? It's a cleaner version, okay? as you said before. It's more repetitive because at the end of the day, you do not want to sound smart. You want to get your message across. Uh, your communicative competence can be more important than your proficiency. Okay? And that's pretty obvious as well. You're extremely cooperative, which is sometimes a problem because some native speakers, not you, may not be as cooperative when they enter uh, you know, an, inter an interaction with other ELF speakers. And there have been reports of communication breakdowns in ELF communication when a native speaker comes in, because people feel judged, okay, and people feel like they're not the owners of the code that they're using anymore. Okay? And then, also, it's creative. It's creative in the sense that people find new ways of communicating meaning that are not present in native English, okay? So now, we're not going to discuss this because I'm going to run out of time and I would like to move on to the very last part, okay? Which is, wow, probably the most controversial thing here, okay? So, we mentioned uh, intelligibility before, okay? But now I'm going to try and, well, define intelligibility, okay? At least the way it's normally seen in English as a lingua franca research, okay? So there are two things that we need to comment on here. The first one is the intelligibility principle, okay? So we just assume that it's more important to be intelligible than it is to sound native or native-like. This is our ultimate objective, okay? And the second thing is the way it has been found that non-native speakers of English, even very proficient ones, process information and process uh, English input, okay? so. I don't know if you know what top-down and bottom-up pro processing is, but basically at the phonological level, uh, top-down processing means that even if there is information missing, you use contextual cues to fill in the gaps in the message that you've received. And then bottom-up processing is just basically attending to the very phonological detail. Okay? So it has been found that even, pr that even proficient English speakers who are non-native use a lot more bottom-up processing uh, strategies than native speakers, okay, who do not have to understand and receive all the phonological information, and they will still understand you, but uh, it's not so easy with non-native speakers, okay? So imagine a situation in which um, I say lead instead of red, okay, and you've got a red car in front, well, in front of you on or in a picture, for example, but you still, well, a native speaker would, um, for a native speaker, it would be easier to understand that I'm talking about a red car. They would just disregard whatever the input is, and they would, they would use the context. But for a non-native speaker, it may not be so easy, and they may rely too much on the phonological cues. And that is why, okay, they may be much more confounded by the message, okay, and by the conflicting messages, okay, the phonological input, input, and the contextual input, okay. So um, native speakers tend to do that well to solve these problems quite easily, while non-native speakers uh, have bigger problems. So um, another thing that I like to say is that um, I'd I like to do one uh, practical activity with you is that there is another concept that we might you know, consider, which is comprehensibility. And that is different to intelligibility, because while intelligibility is just what you received phonologically, and whether you can say, ooh, you said dog, 
I write D-O-G, it's dog. Comprehensibility is about how easy or difficult you think I am to understand, okay? So it's a relative measure, okay? And they do not always match because you can understand me perfectly, but so, well, some speakers are harder to understand than, well, than others, although you understand both, okay? Now, uh, on the next slide, well, well, sorry, uh, in the same table, we, we've also got foreign accentedness, which is shaded out. So again, you may judge people's you know, level of foreign accent, okay? But this is shaded out because English as lingua franca does not deal with that, okay? A foreign accent is something that is assumed as per perfectly normal, okay? And now just for fun a little bit, I would like us to take a look at some foreign accents, and I would like you to tell me where they come from, okay? Six spoons of fresh snow peas, five thick slabs of blue cheese, and maybe a snack for her brother Bob. Okay. Great. How did you know? S. The S, which sounds kind of like a shirt. Okay. But is it intelligible? Yes. Okay. Then we've got a second accent. I've only chosen, well, quite common accents. Please go Stella. Fresh snow peas, five thick slabs. Yeah, so somebody already said France. Please come, Stella. Ask her to bring these things we have got from the store. Six spoons of fresh snow peas, five thick slabs of blue cheese, and maybe a snack for a brother Bob. We also need a small plastic snack and a big toy for our kids. She can scoop these things in the very red bags. This is. Yeah. So this was German, as you can see. I could actually hear that it was German. Please call Stella. Ask her to bring three things with her from. Well, I don't have the text. It's the same text. It comes from a website that's called well, Speech Accent Archive. But they basically, well, it's a very simple text. Please call Stella and ask her to bring something. Can't remember now. Hmm? But it's not there, so I'm afraid I can't do it now. This was Japanese. It is. I chose the, well, the harder accents, I mean, from very proficient students. Okay, we're just going to do another one, and then we're going to move on. So this one, I think, is non-European as well. Please call Stella. Ask her to bring these things to the from the store. Six spoons of fresh snow peas, five thick slabs of blue cheese, and maybe a snack for her brother Bob. We also need a small plastic snake and a big toy frog for the kids. She can scoop these things into three red bags, and we will go meet her Wednesday at the train station. Nope. This is Singapore. Okay, so this is a nativized version of English, but the speaker's mother tongue is uh, Mandarin Chinese. Anyway, I need to skip this. I had Polish Mandarin and Slovak as well. But I've only got five minutes, and I would like to get to the most important part of my presentation, and probably the one that answers the very title of my presentation. And this is why... Sorry, but something seems to be... Yeah. We meet an unrecoverable problem. Mm. Okay, so why this is coming on. Now I'm going to tell you about a theory, a theoretical construct, which basically is a set of phonological features that you need to preserve if you want to be understood uh, internationally in English, okay? There is some research, but not a lot of research, and especially not a lot of quantitative research to confirm this, okay? Most of this is based on uh, the researchers classroom observations, okay, of those deviations from the native norm that cause intelligibility and those that don't, okay? So when it's on, I think that we can start. I don't want to, I don't, I don't want this one because we need to, we need to move on. So I would skip 
two days. Okay. Yeah, this one. All right, so very, very briefly, what do you have to do in order to make yourselves understood in English in terms of phonology, okay? Now, the first one is that all consonants are considered to be necessary, okay? But you can basically leave out th and the, why? Because some native accents of English have also got rid of these, okay? Irish English has a t and the, uh, London English has a f and the, or the, so well. And there was an article in, where is it, in the Telegraph, uh, that was saying that in London probably these two, well, these two sounds are going to disappear by 2050, okay? So you shouldn't worry about these, okay? Uh, what is important in the consonants is that all voicing and all aspiration should be retained, okay? So you should distinguish between s and z, and you should distinguish, well, you should go t, k, and p, okay? That is important, although there are many languages that do not have aspiration, okay? So consonants are very important, but then we're coming, well, sorry, consonant clusters are also important, okay? So groups of consonants, and if you want, if you find it hard to pronounce certain groups of consonants, it's always better to add something than to get rid of a consonant, okay? And if you want to simplify a cluster, please do it only at the very end of a word, okay? Because if you do it at the beginning, that will be a much bigger problem, okay? We've got certain examples here. You can see that ba for bag was then pronounced bago, and that was understood as bag, okay? Because addition is always better than, well, or insertion is always better than deletion. Uh, vowels, now this is probably the most surprising thing. Uh, in English as a lingua franca studies, <laughs> it is assumed that vowels and vowel quality is not so important. So basically whether you say ah, ah, ah is not such a huge thing, but it is necessary to preserve the length of vowels in English, okay? So long vowels should be long and short vowels should be short. And the only vowel that is causing, um, the only vowel quality that is causing intelligibility problems is the vowel in uh, so the vowel in nurse, which is rhotic, well, in American English, but it's just uh in, um, in British English and other non-rhotic accents. Okay, so you should preserve this vowel. Now, all that said, I have to say that there is some research that says that other vowel qualities are also important. So there is still a lot of research to be done, but, well, this core is being worked on. Okay? Uh, and, well, you may be surprised, I'll be finishing in two minutes, maybe. Uh, you may be surprised by this, but if you look at the English vowel system, you will see that all dialect differences are in vowels, okay? So basically, you shouldn't worry so much, because even native speakers use different vowels for the same phoneme, or different vowel phonetic realizations for the same phoneme. If you look at the vowel in strut, for example, it's pronounced strut in Northern England, but it can also be pronounced strut in some, uh, well, dialects here, okay? And even nowadays, things are happening to this vowel and it's changing its pronunciation in British English, okay? And in American English, it's much more centralized. It's not an a, uh, it's an a uh, in some dialects, especially in the South. Uh, anyway, the last important thing in terms of phonology is to preserve nuclear stress, but not word stress, okay? Nuclear stress is differentiating things like, I've rented a flat, I've rented a flat, I have rented a flat, and I've rented a flat, because English, as you know, is a, um, a language with a very strict word order, okay? And this is why you need those variations to, con to convey different meanings, while in other languages you can just change the position of words um, in a sentence. And it's also been found that word stress is not important, so there is very little confusion if you misplace the word stress in a word. And again, during the opening ceremony, some Slovak speakers spoke with, an, well, with initial stress, where, well, there should have been a different kind of stress, and it was perfectly understandable, okay? However, it's also true that in some studies, native speakers have been, well, found to rely a lot on word stress, okay? So still there is, uh, well, the evidence is not conclusive. And one thing that I really very much like, because this is something that, well, is confirmed by my teaching practice, is that sometimes 
you should use spelling pronunciation if you really want to be understood. And this was actually suggested, this example was suggested by Dieter Ding, that probably in the outer circle, if you go to Asia and you want to buy some salmon, you should probably pronounce it salmon, and then people will understand you better, okay? Because they expect that L, okay? While, well, the native varieties do not have the L, okay? So this is just a little suggestion to finish, okay? And, well, I wanted to analyze, well, a little bit of Marie Kondo, but we don't have time for that, okay? This is the analysis of her speech. Uh, well, some conclusions. Well, already seen, well, um, all this, but I would like to stress that when we talk about English as lingua franca, it is empowering to the speakers, okay, to know that they do not have to actually sound like anyone. They can just sound the way they want to sound because they choose to speak the way they choose, and it's perfectly okay, okay? Uh, there are also some, well, obvious conclusions or questions that you might ask yourselves as polyglots, okay? So, well, the first one is kind of provocative. Why learn multiple languages in a world dominated by English? I think that that's going to be answered in our next talk, obviously. I'm very keen on learning languages and I think that there are a lot of reasons. Uh, what are your goals when studying English? And how are they different to your goals in other languages, okay? based on how English and other languages are used in the world, okay? And to sum up, I would like to say that although native speakers of English, well, some of them present here, pride themselves on English, it is only an international language to the extent that it is not their language, okay? Because it has been chosen by other people in the world, by other nations, okay? And remember that people at the end of the day do communicate effectively, although they're not, well, although they're not native speakers, so. That is my final message. This is, well, these are some references. If you want a list of references, I can send it to you, no problem. And then if you've got any questions, I am ready. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much for your talk. We have time maybe for one short question. Um, what is your opinion on Globish, the simplified English? Uh, yeah. So, um, my opinion is... Mm, that's a very tough question because I'm a teacher and at the end of the day I teach British English to my students, okay? Uh, I think that, well, and this is something that I've mentioned already, I think that as a teacher, for example, uh, because the question is, what's your opinion? Should we teach it? I think that we should make students, you know, uh, aware of the fact that English is used as a lingua franca, okay? I do not think that we should lower the standard, but I think that when, for example, you design your curriculum, when you design your syllabi, there are certain priorities, okay, that you can... Um, there are certain features that you can prioritize based on research and based what you know those students will actually need, uh, which are not always reflected in textbooks. Okay, so I don't think that we should teach a simplified version of English uh, from the very start. But I do think that certain things should not be you know paid so much attention to as others. Okay, and that should be based on research and w on what people actually use. Well, just one example, for example. Okay, uh, there is a book. Uh, there is a, a PhD dissertation, for example, uh, well, for example, that gives an overview of how phrasal verbs are used in international English. So some phrasal verbs are used quite a lot, but some phrasal verbs that are taught are not used at all. So what should we do? We should probably get rid of those or leave them for later levels. But this is something that everybody has to, well, decide, okay? So I think that you could make priorities in your course design, okay, based on this, okay? But I, I don't think that globish should be what you actually teach at this point. Okay, we will see what happens in 50 years. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you again. <laughs>